and welcome to our unit three in calculus. Unit three, we talk about our existence theorems. Hopefully these are three very short videos about our three existence theorem, the extreme value theorem, the intermediate value theorem, and the mean value theorem. Today we're going to begin with the extreme value theorem. So our learning objective is that you'll be able to use the existence theorems to describe the behavior of a function over an interval. That's going to be our same learning objective each time, but we're just going to change which existence theorem we're dealing with. So in order to talk about the extreme value theorem, I first need to ex recall extrema because that's what it's related to. So just a reminder about what extrema is. I've got a photo here. Oops. I've got a photo here um, for an example. I've got a graph. And if I look right here, I have what's called an absolute minimum. And if I look at it related over here, I have an absolute max. But we also have a local max, a local min, and a local min over here. So what's the big difference between these? So the big difference that I would say is that you have two numbers or two words we actually use often. And so that's absolute as well as as global and that's uh, local as well as relative so these are interchangeable words that we are allowed to use so I just want to make sure that we recognize those for what they are and we can understand them okay so when we have absolute and global extrema which is these words over here when we have absolute and global extrema um, those are literally the highest and the lowest point. So the max of an absolute would be the highest point, which is why we have that one right here, the absolute max. And its counterpart down here is the absolute min. Um, over here, down here, I'm having a hard time. There we go. There's my absolute min is over here. So any max min points, which as you see, there's a valley right here, or sorry, a mountain right here and a valley right here. And then I've got another min point. Now, extrema can occur where you're used to seeing it, the little mountain or the valley, that, that change in concavity up and that change in concavity down, however you want to call that. Y'all are used to seeing extrema with maxes and mins. But as you can see on this right-hand side, there's a local min right here, and it's that's a little bit different looking, isn't it? It's not a peak, it's not a valley, it's just an endpoint that happens to be a minimum. And that's going to kind of help us with today's um, activity, with today's uh, theorem. So here I have four different instances. It's the same parabola, it's still x squared, but I have four different instances of their domain. So let's break them down step by step. So here's A. Look at its domain. Its domain is from negative infinity to positive infinity. So does it have a min? Does it have a max? Let's look at that graph. There's a min right here. And so that tells me that I have a minimum at x equals 0. But if I'm going to infinity, if there is no end to my domain, then I have no maximum because infinity is not a real number. So it's not at x equals infinity or anything like that. It simply tells me there is no max because I'm going off in an infinite direction. But let's look at a second example. Here, what's the only thing that's changing? It's the domain. My domain is going from 0 to 2, but it, they have those little brackets. And what do those brackets represent? They represent what we call a closed interval. And in a closed interval, you are including, when we use brackets, we are including those endpoints. So if I look here, I can see that I've got some, uh, I've got a graph and I've got that minimum. I'm going to get my laser pointer out. I've got that minimum and the minimum stays the same. It's down here. And how can I ensure that I'm allowed to use that? Well, what's that x value? That's x equals zero. Let's look at our domain. Is zero included? It's a bracket. So yes, it's included. So that means we do have an absolute min at x equals zero. But what about up here? If I keep going along on my domain from zero to two, look, I do have a max point. It's the highest point of that function on the interval from zero to two. Because I'm including two, and I see that in this bracket right here, then I know I have an absolute max at x equals two. Let's look at a different example. What about this one? Let's look at our domain. Now this domain is a mixed interval, right? It's neither closed nor open. It's both. So what about zero? Am I including zero or not? Well, a parenthesis tells me that I am not including zero. So if I am not including zero down here, even though it looks like, okay, that's the lowest end of my graph, but what number is that? It can't be zero because I'm not including it. Then you might tell me, well, what if it's approaching zero? What if I say it's 0 0.1? Okay, but what about the infinite number of numbers between zero and 0 0.1? 
Then you might tell me, okay, what about 0. 0.00001? Again, the same question comes back. What about the infinite number of numbers between those two points? Because we are infinitely approaching zero, we can't include it. That means there is no min, but there is still a max. My final example is an open interval entirely. I am neither including zero, I am neither including two. So that means if I look at the lower, the lower hand, well, my lowest point, I'm infinitely approaching zero. So there's no min. My highest point, I'm infinitely approaching uh, two, or x equals two. So there is no max. So that's kind of a little recall about extrema. So let's dive really quickly into the extreme value theorem. In each of our theorems, I'm going to give you a list of assumptions. And when I say assumptions, these are the first things you're checking for. If you don't check for these first, then what's the point in applying your uh, calculus to it? Because what happens if one of your assumptions is false? If one of your assumptions is false, all that math you just did is null and void because you're not meeting the standards of the theorem. So with the extreme value theorem, we start with two basic, uh, basic assumptions that are actually going to track through with all of our theorems. We suppose that f of x is continuous. So check number one, is it continuous? We also suppose that it's on a closed interval. Check two, look for a closed interval. If your function doesn't, isn't continuous or it is not on a closed interval, then there is no extreme value theorem. So you can stop your work right there. That's why we start at those first two, two steps. But if it is continuous and on a closed function, then I know that f of x must have both a maximum value and a minimum value on the closed interval a to b. That's, that's, that's a mouthful, isn't it? What does that mean? Uh, oh, and the max and or min points may occur at A and or B. But I try to break it down a little bit easier for you. The extreme value theorem deals with extrema. So that kind of should help you. Extreme, extrema it should help you understand where we're going. And as long as I know both assumptions, and what are those two assumptions I'm checking for? I'm checking if it's continuous, and I'm checking if it is on a closed interval. So if it's continuous and on a closed interval, I know there must be a max, and I know there must be a min. And if it doesn't look like a max and a min that I'm used to seeing, for example, if it doesn't happen to look like that or like that, there's a max right here and a min right here. If it doesn't happen to look like that, then they might be at the endpoints. Okay? So, kind of makes sense, doesn't it? I'm hoping it does. And I've got two examples here for you to try and help us. Ah, well, before I've got examples, I've got some visual representations for us. So, let me get that laser pointer back. So, in this example, I have a max right here and I have a min. But wouldn't this point right here also become considered a minimum point? But does it happen to be the absolute minimum? Well, let's compare it. Is this my lowest point? Well, no, I've got a lower point. Is this my highest point? Well, no, I've got a higher point. But what about over here? There are no mountains. There are no valleys. So therefore, my highest point is this endpoint. And my lowest point is this endpoint. Over here, Let's look. I've got a high point over here, but I should always stop and check the endpoints. Well, this endpoint isn't higher and neither is this. So this must be my max. Now I've got an endpoint here. Well, that's pretty low, but look, I've got another endpoint over here. That one must be my min. Over here, you might think this is your minimum and this is your maximum, but we're forgetting to look for that valley. This right here happens to be lower than this. So this is the lowest point. That means that is my minimum. So let's actually figure out how to solve these. Today, you're only solving these graphically. We have a second video set coming back after we finish Unit 4 because we have to understand some parts from Unit 4 to apply back here. So today, you're only going to solve this graphically. You're going to plug it into a graph. You're going to see if it's a closed interval. And if it is, identify that interval. Make sure it's continuous. Identify your maximum points. What's the lowest and, high, the lowest and highest points on your graph? And make sure. Check your endpoint. Just because you see a low, maybe a valley, just because you see a high, maybe a mountain, doesn't mean that an endpoint might not be lower or higher. So always test them. When we get to the analytical solves in part two, we're going to be discussing critical points or critical values. That's that big key word that we don't know yet. So that's why we can't discuss the analytical solves of the extreme value theorem. Okay, so I have some examples right here. I have the graph function f of x is equal to x to the power 2 thirds. And it's on the interval negative 2 to 3. So I'm going to do this graphically. So of course, the first thing I'm going to do is graph it. 
So here's my graph. But then what am I supposed to check? I'm supposed to check for my two assumptions. Assumption number one asks me, is it continuous? Well, as I'm trucking along, do 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 do, and I'm looking at this graph, boom, down, and all the way up. I can draw that graph without picking up my pencil. So is it continuous? Check. Absolutely. Is it a closed interval? Are the endpoints included? Heck yeah, they are. Look at this right here. And in fact, Sometimes they'll even include the word closed interval to kind of give you a clue. So is it closed? Yes. So I've hit my two assumptions. That means if I've hit my two assumptions, I know there must be a max and there must be a min. So I look to my graph. What's the lowest point on my graph? Hey, it's right there. Well, what is that coordinate point? That's the origin. So that's zero comma zero. Oh, sorry. I'm looking at my own, I'm looking at my min, my sincerest apologies. Let's try that again. Okay, so what is my max? My max would be the highest point. It might be this, okay, or it might be this, but which one is higher on the y value? It happens to be this point over here, which is 3, 2. So that's my max point. And my min point, well, it could be this, but isn't this the lowest point on my graph, which is the origin of 0, 0? That's it. We're done. It was continuous. It was on a closed interval. So here is my max, and here is my min. My max happened to be at an endpoint, which is part of what the extreme value theorem tells me. Now we have another question. And again, this time it's a piecewise function. f of x is equal to this. And so I have to figure out, OK, does the extreme value theorem meet this piecewise function? So we haven't learned anything analytically, so the first thing I do is graph it. Well, there's my graph. So I ask myself my two assumptions. Is it continuous? Well, I'm looking at it. I've got a polynomial on the left and a linear function on the right, and there's no, there's no hole, there's no ass, or sorry, jump, there's no asymptote that's going to change that. So yes, it's continuous. Is it a closed interval? Okay. We are looking from negative 5 to positive 5. It is a closed interval, so we're good to go. So now I can test, check what's my max and what's my min because I know there has to be a max, there has to be a min, and they might occur at my endpoints. So I look for the highest point on my graph. I'm going to change my color here real quick. I look for the highest point on my graph. Well, look at this. I have a mountain right there. I have a valley or some sort of funkiness happening right there, couldn't that be a max and that's a min? Okay, very possibly, but I should never forget, I can check my endpoints. So looking at this point right here, okay, look at that, it's not as high as that endpoint right there. So I actually do have, ah, what is that? Okay, I actually do have a max and it's not at that uh, mountain right there, it's actually at the end point right here, which is approximately four and what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I think four comma seven. And where's my min? Again, is it gonna be this little valley down here? Well, I should always test my endpoints. And so I check this endpoint. Well, that's the max. Well, I check this endpoint down here. Hey, guess what? That's the lowest point on my graph. So that's approximately negative two, maybe negative five. Okay, and that's those are my answers. Okay. Um, I don't have any more examples for us. I have a continuity question coming up just to kind of recall some concepts. But um, my question to you would be this. What happens when you get an example that isn't continuous? If you get a piecewise that's not continuous or a graph that you know can't be continuous at that point or on that interval, then you don't have an extreme value theorem. What happens if it's continuous but it's no longer on the closed interval? If it's on an open interval, again, you don't have the extreme value theorem. So double check your assumptions first. Don't waste your time looking for a max and a min if you can't meet continuity and if it's not on a closed interval. All right, so let's move on to my last little question. This is a question recalling continuity. This is a question from the AP exam that is missed often because we forget about what the formal definition of continuity is, what a limit is, and how it relates to the function. So we're asked if the limit as x approaches a of f of x is equal to some L, where L is a real number, then which of the following must exist or must be true? A says f of a exists. So what is f of a? Is that details about my function? Okay, do I have any information about my function? I have information about a limit, which is an approach of a function. I don't have information about the function, so it can't be a. 
Well, what about B? F of X is continuous. Well, what's the definition of continuity? The definition of continuity tells me my limit as I approach some C point or some value has to be equal to the function at C. Well, do I know anything about the function? Again, no. So I can't declare continuity. Here, f of x is defined. Again, is that asking about the limit or the function? It's talking about the function. I don't know anything about the function, so it can't be c. And finally, we have f of a is equal to l. Well, again, isn't that the fourth time we're talking about the function? At no point did any of these answer choices mention anything about the limit. Continuity kind of touched on it, but there's a second half of continuity, right? So my only answer, ah, what's your final answer? Sorry. My only answer is none of the above, and that's the correct answer. The biggest thing to take from this is to recall, first of all, the definition of continuity is that your limit as you approach some number has to be equal to the function value at that same number. So if you have a question about a limit and an answers are about a function, those are not comparable. Your limit is not your function, and your function is not your limit. I made y'all repeat that back to me a million times in unit one, but we're in unit three, and maybe we've forgotten, so I'm going to keep bringing that back until we recall what the actual definition of continuity is. All right, a little bit of wrap-up on that extreme value theorem. My two things I check for first. First thing I check for is continuity. Then I check if it's a closed interval. If I don't meet those two, I'm not checking for the EVT at all. But if I do meet those two, I know there must be a max and there must be a min. Those are two guarantees. But the only guarantee I have about it is that it's a max and a min. There's no guarantee that it's a mountain or a valley because they may occur at the end points. All righty. I know this was a little bit longer than my other videos, but the IVT and MVT will, will run through a lot quicker. So I'll see you guys in class and see you next time.